This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is comedian, author, and internet sensation, Steve Hofstetter. Happy holidays, everyone. Today on Sports Files, we take a little different path from our usual type of guest. As always, we try to bring you some of the biggest names in sports, both locally and nationally. And once in a while, we go beyond the world of sports. Today, I sit down with a stand up. Yes, we roll in the funny on Sports Files. Steve Hofstetter is actually much more than your typical stand up comedian. Sure, he does hundreds of dates per year, entertaining his fans throughout the country. He's probably played every funny bone, Laugh Factory, and Giggles from Maine to California. But Steve is a renaissance man. He is an author, an internet guru with one of the most popular podcasts around, and a leader in what can easily be described as new age comedy. The twist with Steve, however, and the reason he interests us so much, is that his background includes sports. In fact, that's where he started. Among his jobs was columnist for Sports Illustrated. So today we talk sports and comedy with a man who likes to shoot from the hip and often does. The comedic stylings of Steve Hostetter next on Sports Files. Hey, Steve, it's great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm happy to be here. All right, how's this all start in sports? You graduate from Columbia. You're writing for SportsIllustrated.com. You're doing a hockey blog. Yep. And then eventually you turn it into comedy. But, but how did the sports, the love of sports, and that profession start for you? I was raised on stories of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Like, my, my father was allowed to take school off on opening day. Mm -hmm. Like, that was, he's got a ball signed by the 1952 team. That was a gift from Roy Campanella. And don't think for a moment we were like rich or connected. My grandfather ran an electric store that Campanella was a customer at. Like that's how it happened. But that, that was my upbringing. And so I was raised to be a sports fan. I was, well, I say, I say sports, what I really mean are the Mets and the Knicks. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so I like minor league ball. But I, it, it's just something that's always been part of me. Well, you start out and actually get a gig with the New York Yankees. It was so yeah. reminiscent of Seinfeld and the Seinfeld fans out there with Costanza getting a job. You get a job. Yeah. It was unexpected. And how did that work out? It was while it was while Costanza was working for the Yankees. So there was immediately when everybody, oh, what do you do? I work for the Yankees. Immediately the first thing was like, oh, like George Costanza, and I had to be like, you know, he's not real. Right. <laughs> like he's just a right. It's Jason Alexander. <laughs> like it's not a real guy. But their Steinbrenner impression, dead on. Absolutely dead. With Larry on. David. Uh, yeah, I I almost met Steinbrenner three times. All three times, I purposefully avoided him because if he doesn't know your name, he can't fire you. <laughs> like I was working for their, I, I wrote for their website and I wrote for their magazine, and so if something went wrong with either one, and he knew who I was, he would have been like, fire the website guy, mm -hmm. that guy, the exactly. redhead guy. Uh, there was once I almost knocked him over. I was running through the hallway. And the, the, the old Yankee Stadium, the, the corridors are super narrow. And I'm running through the hallway after a game trying to get a story. And all of a sudden, I see a security guard kind of just motion over really quick. And I'm like, what is he doing? And I step to the side. If I hadn't stepped to the side, I'd have shouldered him in the face. I would have shouldered George Steinbrenner in the face. And that would have been the end of my career and my life and everything else. And this is, this is pre-comedy. This is yeah. also where you left Columbia and would later go back and graduate. Yeah. So you're working here for the Yankees. And... It's interesting, you, you, you go back to school once that job ends, Yeah. and how did you get the SI.com gig, and then you're doing blogging for the New York Rangers, and you gotta, uh, that's interesting in itself, we'll get, a, get into that, but how did you make that transition? Well, I, I think it was, uh, the real problem was it's very hard to market yourself as a sports writer when you have a sense of humor, mm -hmm. because sports fans don't. They want seriousness. Sports fan, it is amazing. I have written politics, I've written race, I've written religion, all that stuff. Nothing. I wrote making fun of the Kansas City Royals death threats. Death threats. <laughs> there was once where I, I made fun of, uh, when I was working for SI, I wrote a column. Basically, the premise was, your team's not going to win this year. 
Like, understand that the way the math works, if your team wins once in 25 years, you're above the curve. You've got to understand that. Right. And one of the things I said specifically was like, I was like, the Rays are not going to win this year. So this guy sends me this hate-filled, this just terrible email about how the Rays are leading the league and just one of those stupid statistics about like strikeouts on a Monday and a full moon and that means just one of those dumb things. And, you know, and, and how dare I, blah, blah, blah. So then they finish in third place that year. And so I write back to him and I was like, hey, uh, if you have a moment, I would love an apology. <laughs> if you just have a moment in your you day. You didn't get the apology. Yeah, no, no, he was, uh, he was still mad. So you, you take the, you start doing comedy, yeah. While you're working the gig for SI.com, and then you're doing the blogging for the New York Rangers. And by the way, he's you're from Queens, so you're a New York Rangers fan. Huge and I, Ranger fan. I was 15 when they won the cup, which okay. which was exciting. But at the same time, everybody else is like, "We're waiting 54 years." I'm like, I started watching last season. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just I never really got into you, hockey before that. You're locked out. Yeah. But but you took the humor that you started with these clubs into what you were doing. For SI.com. Yeah. And talk about that, and especially with the blog, um, because there were a lot of well, stars who were blogging for their particular hockey team. I got, I was definitely the troublemaker of us because each team had a blogger. Right. And everyone was famous except for me. Like, I had a bit of a following, but we're talking like the, the Kings was Alicia Cuthbert. Mm. So this is, and I think like while she's on 24, you know, so this is. She's very famous. She's a star. Yeah, she's a star, and I'm a comic. And so I basically devoted my blog to trying to get Alicia Cuthbert's attention. I was single at the time, and I figured, why not try to... She was dating a hockey player. She was dating, uh, she was dating Avery, who was on right, the Kings. Right, right. Got traded to the Rangers midseason, and I figured, oh, this is going to be the time. No, nothing. Not a word. Not a... I feel like if we had Twitter then, maybe I could have gotten a retweet or something. <laughs> But absolutely, absolutely nothing. But you're blogging about Alicia Cuthbert, not even talking about the Rangers. Yeah, but people were having a great time with it. Like, it was just every time I could write, I, I would just find a way to write about the Kings. I would talk about the Rangers, and I'm like, oh, yeah, they're going to play the Kings in a couple weeks. I'm writing parentheses, hi, Alicia. You know, so it was just like whatever I could do. I made it a running joke that I was going to get her attention, and it never happened. Sports is very important to you. So you've, yeah. you've weaved sports, the background, the jobs, your love for the sport or for sports in general yeah. into comedy. Tell us how you how you do that. But it, well, first of all, it's very difficult because you've got to do broad jokes because like a, like a hockey fan won't get a basketball joke mm -hmm. and a basketball fan won't get a NASCAR joke and a NASCAR fan won't get anything. So it's very difficult <laughs> to do. I'm just trying to see how you're, many you're angry letters I can get in right? Tennessee. I, <laughs> they can't write letters. Anyway, the the idea is that you can't like I would love to make a good Andy Chavez joke. Who's going to get it? Right. You know, maybe Andy's parents will be at the show. So uh, I, it's, it's difficult. But what I try to do is whenever there is a big story, whenever there is, I went on a quest to try to get Barry Bonds' nickname, because he doesn't have a nickname. He's like the one, like, slugger. I can't say Hall of Famer, because fingers mm -hmm. crossed he mm -hmm. won't be. Uh, but he's the one, like, big slugger that doesn't have a nickname. So I tried, I was using my SI column to try to get him called the human cantaloupe. And I actually offered, I offered $10 to anyone who went to, who went to go to a Giants game with a melon helmet. <laughs> I was like, send me a picture of you in a melon helmet. So I would try to do stuff like that. You know, uh, I did a bunch of stuff on steroids on you know, just whatever the issue of the day is that enough people know. Yeah, I've seen some of your stuff with, with steroids, some things that we can't uh, repeat here today. No, but it's you, online. But you it's do on, have some great stories yeah. about the Yankees while you were there and steroids, well, this right? Is, this is one I've never told on the air, and I might get, uh, what's the word, sued. But <laughs> so I, was, I worked for the Yankees in 2000. I was embedded in the clubhouse in 2000. Right. And because I wrote for the team, I was privy to a lot because I wasn't allowed to write about it. And so I ended up being kind of in the background and in a lot of stuff. Uh, but there was one moment that I didn't realize what it meant at the time until years later when Jason Grimsley got implicated. Yes. So I was interviewing Grimsley, and this is a big, tough guy. Grimsley is probably, you know, I think he's like 6'3", 220, solid muscle. This is a really big, just, just burly dude. And I was interviewing him, and I asked him if he wanted his kids to be baseball players, and he started crying. Which completely took me aback. He just, you know, like straight up, like, I mean, not that whole like, <gasps> right, you know, right, not right. the, but straight up tears. Sure. And he said, I would never want them to go through what I went through to get here. And at the time, I thought he meant 
He was a journeyman minor leaguer for a while, a lot of bus trips, didn't realize what he meant. What he meant was steroids because that was the season that half the clubhouse ended up, you know, that's the Mitchell report. That was the 2000 Yankees. Mm -hmm. And so he basically right then was saying, I don't want my kids to lie, cheat and steal to get here. And it's this, it's one of these, you don't realize what it is at the time, but thinking back, like, if I were to make a movie about it, that would have been an early scene in the movie so that you could look back at it at the end and be like, that's what he meant. Ah, I get it. That's what he meant. You have, uh, you, you've been on Craig Ferguson's uh, The Late 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 Show. You've been on the uh, Comics Unleashed. Of course, you've done mm -hmm. E! True Hollywood Story, part of Clay, a I don't know how, <laughs> what? You're part of Clay Aiken's? I was on Clay e Aiken's Hollywood, what? True Hollywood Story. I've never met him. I just, I was, ma I was making fun of him one day to a producer. And they loved it? And they loved it. Yeah, they, I was talking to a producer who was telling me that they were they were doing a whole thing about how he was uh, he was he used to be like a choir boy when he first started that's how he started singing right and just on the spot without even thinking I said that means he started off with hymns and never quite made it to hers <laughs> and she was like hey do you want to be in the show and that line that line that got me the show didn't even air because that line the lawyers cut it out they cut it they, out the lawyers cut it out well, they're afraid of everything yeah um, but now it aired look at that Clay it's now it's on. All these shows, though, that you've done, really, yeah. it pales in comparison to really where you've gained your following through the podcast you do and, and your YouTube hits. And now yeah. I, you do over 300 gigs a year at comedy clubs, but really your name got out because of that. So social media, in a sense, has really helped the modern comedian, right? It's, it's been huge. And actually, I got my start. I was the first writer for collegehumor.com. And so that's kind of where I got my start in the comedy world. And that built, that built, and there were people who were saying like, oh, you're my favorite comedian when I had never even done stand-up. They were just reading my columns and misunderstood and thought I was a stand-up. And so when I started doing stand-up, I was playing the wow. colleges. And so it was this slow build. And, you know, from the fans I was building at the colleges, you know, they would then tell their friends about me. But without social media, it's a much more difficult thing to say, hey, go watch this guy. Well, when's he going to be in my town again? In two years. So instead, they were like, go watch this guy. Well, where can I see him? Look at this clip. And so suddenly, you know, I'm up to, you know, 8,000 views a day and 15,000 views a day. And now I get over 30,000 views every day on my YouTube. Like when I get below 30,000, it's a bad day. And it's just been, it's been this huge just snowball down the hill and it would not have happened without this social media world we're in right now. And how can people see you on that podcast and, and on YouTube? Well, the, so my podcast is both a video and audio. Okay. So they can go to iTunes. Uh, it's, it's one of the top 150 podcasts. It's called uh, High Confidence, Low Self-Esteem, uh, which I think describes me and a lot of other people. I yes, assume. it does. They're, yeah, I think everyone with high confidence, because we all, back in the back of your mind, you know, you know. You're like, I can do what you're doing. Yeah, you're like, I'm, I'm the best at everything. Please think that. Would you please think that? <laughs> so, so that's my podcast. It's uh, me and Danny Jollis, who's another comic. He's my co-host. And we bring on a bunch of guests. We bring on, uh, we've had all kinds of comedians on it. And, and it, we just talk about, so I complain on it a lot. I have this thing that I always say. I say, like, people ask me how my life is. I'm like, oh, I can't complain. Well, I shouldn't, <laughs> but I will. But I, I should not complain. Uh, and, and they could check me out on, on YouTube. And Google will correct the spelling of my name. But it's probably on the bottom of the screen right now, right? Yeah, I think, I think, do that. I, I think we got it right. Here, can yes. I point? Yeah. Is yeah, it around, yeah, somewhere we're, around they're there? They're going to pop it up, yeah, anyway. Right, yeah, um, we'll do that. You're also, you're, you're known for being able to handle hecklers. And not all that's comedians can do that. That's very important. Yeah. And you got to be quick on your feet, obviously, at libbers That's what, what all comedians are. But they're not always good. How do you handle these hecklers? Uh, well, the, the way I put it is I never, I never attack anyone at a show unless they start with me and then they're dead. <laughs> like if someone made their night about me, if someone, you know, went and got a babysitter and bought the tickets and showed up and bought two drinks and whatever it is, it's not my job to look at them and be like, that's a dumb shirt. Like I hate when comedians do that. Right. But if someone interrupts the show, if someone dares interrupts everyone else's good time, they're, they're dead to me. And so... The way I deal with them, uh, two things. One, I give them enough rope to hang themselves. Mm -hmm. You let them talk. Because mm -hmm. if they're dumb enough to interrupt the show, they're dumb enough to say a lot of other things. And then the other thing you do is, you know that little part of your brain that tells you when to stop talking? Kill him. <laughs> and just go. And if you're funny and you trust yourself to be funny, you will be better than an amateur. So that's, and that's what I do. And I'm, I'm mean also. So people oh, you, tend you to, seem like such a nice guy. I, you know, I try to be. I try to be. It doesn't always work out. What is the 
most po- other than sports, and we know that sports yeah. is part. It's only part of it. You get into everything. And you, sure. Come on, you're smart. You, you, you Columbia background. You got a Columbia degree. Uh, there were some idiots who went there. <laughs> What's what do you like to get into the most? Like what subject do you like to get into the most in a broad sense? I like to talk about anything that uh, that people don't question. You know, my mission is to take a sacred cow and fillet it and to to find something like right now. One of the things I've been talking about is is how we worship parents and how we have there's this ethos that like making having a kid makes you special where I believe that like it takes more effort to order a pizza than it does to have a child because no one's ever ordered a pizza by accident. <laughs> you know, like, no, you don't open your door. How'd this pizza get here? I was hoping God would stop the pizza. Like, it's... And so you do that to a room full of parents. You know, I, I love getting someone who, who completely disagreed with me on an issue. I love that 180. And that's my favorite thing to do, which is, which is part of why I talk sports. But like I said, it can't be too much of the act. Otherwise, it's just not broad enough. Give me a minute on, on the travel, because 300 gigs a year, you're on planes a lot. We were talking oh. before we started this interview about parents and kids on planes. I was, it's the, oh, it's, it's the worst. It's the worst. Every day, every day there's something. I was on a plane once with the cast of Toddlers and Tiaras. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I don't know what kind of language I can use on this show, but I, uh, I, if you've never seen the show, uh, a bunch of little, uh, what's the word, uh, tostitutes? <laughs> I think that's what you call them. Prostitutes? I don't know what to... What do you call a three-year-old professional? <laughs> what do you describe? Oh, child abuse. That's the word. Um, I, I, I think we, we better not go there. I think we fair. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Well, there goes the next 10 minutes. Great stuff, Steve. Let me, uh, before we say goodbye, we do something with all our guests. It's called okay. Five for the Road. So I'll ask the question. You give me the answers first thing to come to mind. All it's right. all sports related. Okay. I know your background now, Queens, New York. So maybe I know the answer to this. Your favorite professional team. Well, the Mets. Okay. Oh, sorry. I answered that wrong. You said professional team. <laughs> Uh, I can't even say New York Giants this year. So uh, my favorite professional team, USC. <laughs> favorite professional athlete of all time? Uh, of all time? Oh, that is a tough question. Uh, I I guess I I was actually a huge Frank Thomas fan. I thought you were gonna go Keith Hernandez. Well, Keith Hernandez. I loved Captain Keith, but actually on the Mets, I loved Greg Jeffries for just because he when he came up, he was hitting like 500 right. for three weeks. Uh, but my favorite all time isn't even a Met, Frank Thomas. The Big Hurt. Loved him. Favorite music? Do you like music? And, and what, do you, do. What, do you, what do you listen to? Old school hip hop. Uh, I, I absolutely love like Trap Called Quest, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, and then some, some more recent stuff that has that same vibe like Jurassic 5. And I like classic rock too. I'm a Creedence fan. And, you know, so I have, a, I have eclectic taste. I would have guessed old school hip hop. Not really. I'm from Queens. I'm from Jamaica, Queens. Favorite movie of all time? I liked it for survival. Favorite movie of all time, uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off and Field of Dreams. Tied. Good choice. And favorite TV show Favorite of all TV time. show, all time, Seinfeld, no question. It is the best. It Steve, is. Steve, thank you so much. Thanks for having Continued me. Continued success. It is my pleasure. We'll take a short break. When we come back, it's overtime. The Memphis Tigers lost a down-to-the-wire battle with Florida Tuesday night at Madison Square Garden. The 15th-ranked Tigers fell behind by 10 early in the first half, but battled back to hold the lead several times in half number two. The problem was the 16th-ranked Gators kept the pressure on and wouldn't go away. Each team made big shots, big stops, and the stars of both teams lived up to their advanced billing. The Tigers had a chance to tie the game in the final moments but Joe Jackson's drive to the hole was defended extremely well by Florida, and his shot was off the mark. The loss snapped the Tigers' six-game winning streak and dropped them to 7-2 overall with their next game Saturday versus Southeast Missouri State at FedEx Forum. The Tigers placed five in double-figure scoring, led by Jackson's 17 points. Fellow seniors Chris Crawford, Michael Dixon Jr., and Jaron Johnson, plus grad student David Pelham, also scored in double figures, Crawford had a season-high four three-pointers. Speaking of the Tigers, head coach Josh Pastner and his staff have already signed four players for next season. One of those players is Chris Hawkins, a junior college forward who plays for Southwest Tennessee Community College here in Memphis. The 6'6 Hawkins leads the Salukis in scoring at just under 19 points per game and does so playing only 19 minutes per contest. 
He is shooting an amazing 72.7% from the field. The only issue for Hawkins is that he's been hurt and has only played in four games. Hawkins, a native of Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, has an injured ankle, which has caused him to sit more than play. He has started the season battling the injury, then was cleared to play and looked extremely good, only to have the injury rear its ugly head again in a recent practice. Recently, we spoke to Hawkins and his current coach about his decision to sign with the University of Memphis and play for Josh Pastner beginning next season. Chris is definitely a dynamic player. Uh, he will fit in greatly with Memphis um, due to the fact that he's a match match problem at all, at all positions. Uh, he's a player that definitely can get to the rim uh, with the new rule changes. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen him. Uh, he's going to kind of get to the free throw line a lot. Um, he has played so far in two games, um, had opportunities. First game was against Walter State um, in Morristown, Tennessee on last Friday. Um, Chris put up great numbers. Uh, he scored 28 points and had seven rebounds. Um, the next night against Rome State, he was in foul trouble a little bit, but he finished with 14-7. Uh, Chris bring a different dimension to our basketball team, and I'm pretty sure he'll bring that same dimension to the Memphis basketball team. One of the reasons why I signed with uh, the University of Memphis is because I love the environment, um, the style of play, um, the, the fan support that they have, and uh, the coaching staff, and, as well as the players. Me, I'm going to bring high energy, uh, high energy every day, a consistent player, just one of those players that's just going to work hard day in and day out to get the job done for my team as well as the fans. Um, my experience here, uh, it's kind of helped me uh, get a feel for the college level game um, and having those environments and all the fans come out and support gives me a lot of energy and it's kind of helped me in, a, in the long run. I'm one of those players that can, can groove with anyone, so I just go in and play as hard as I possibly can and uh, get the job done. I had an AAU basketball coach that uh, kind of was connected in a way with uh, my coach here now at Southwest, uh, Jerry Nichols, kind of spread the word and I just made the move. I love the pressure, uh, but I'm not going to let it overwhelm me, uh, stress me out in, in any kind of way. So I'm just looking forward to playing in a high level, um, playing for the team and playing for the fans as well. And best of luck to Chris and thanks to Jerry Nichols for helping us out. Now joining Hawkins in the Tigers recruiting class for next season is fellow junior college players Treshawn Burrell, a 6'7 forward out of Lee College in Texas, and Avery Woodson, a 6'3 guard from East Mississippi Community College. Woodson will have three years remaining when he joins Memphis and Burrell too. Also part of this class is prep senior guard Dominic McGee from Harvey, Louisiana. The city's professional team, the Grizzlies, are in a tailspin. And not even Dr. James Andrews has the remedy. Injuries continue to be the recurring theme of the campaign, and they are piling up at an alarming rate. Last week, I told you about the season-ending injury to Quincy Pondexter, and now it's a thigh contusion for Mike Conley. Now, Conley's injury is not serious, but enough to cost him a few games. And with Marcus Saul still out, it's just been too much for the Grizzlies to overcome. Searching for a silver lining is like searching for a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. But if there is a glimmer of hope, it's that Gasol has thrown away the crutches and cane and maybe getting closer to returning to the court, although that still appears to be weeks away. There is plenty of blame to go around for this miserable start to the season, including management and new head coach Dave Yeager. But to be fair to the new coach, he's been dealt a hand void of aces and kings. And to really gauge his performance, he at least needs to have his full arsenal for a legitimate period of time. Now, one must wonder if Gasol didn't go down with the injury, were the Grizzlies ready to make another run in the West? Remember that after their initial struggles to begin the season, which included an adjustment period with the new coach and an altered offensive system, the team went back to its usual grit and grind style and swept the four-game trip in California. Then the gates came crashing down. The team did add a player to help with depth at the small forward position as veteran James Johnson, a former first-round draft pick of the Chicago Bulls, was signed, presumably for the remainder of the season. The Grizzlies returned to the court Saturday on the road at the New York Knicks. And finally, our congratulations to University of Memphis senior punter Tom Hornsey, who last week in Orlando, Florida, was named the winner of the Ray Guy Award, which is given annually to the nation's top punter. The native of Australia became only the second Tiger in history to be honored with the National Football Award, following in the footsteps of former Tigers kicker Joey Allison. Earlier this week, Hornsey added to his honors by being named to the Associated Press' first-team All-American squad. 
Tom is hoping his talents will be good enough to land him a job punting in the National Football League, something I can't imagine was even a pipe dream while playing Australian rules football in his native land. And that'll do it for today's show. Next week, we will preview the 2013 edition of the AutoZone Liberty Bowl game with the two head coaches, Mississippi State's Dan Mullen and David Bailiff of Rice. Also, I go one-on-one -on -one with Alabama Crimson Tide defensive coordinator Kirby Smart. As always, remember to see this show or any of our previous shows. Simply log on to WKNO.org and click on KNO Tonight. We want to wish you and yours a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and we will talk to you again next week.